Hello, good evening, and welcome to all of our friends watching live on Facebook and YouTube. My name is Bob Abbey, and I'm an adult services librarian for the city of Forest Grove. We are very fortunate tonight to have uh, with us from Minneapolis, Kabai Strong Washburn. Uh, and we will be chatting with him momentarily about his debut novel, Sharks in the Time of Saviors. Um, I'll bring him in the stream in just a second. Uh, this is the last of our uh, spring live stream programs. Uh, we will be going dark for a couple of months, uh, coming back in August, at the end of August, uh, for another live stream as part of our summer reading program. Uh, we're uh, hosting a program on August 24th with Peter Rock, uh, and we're actually going to be uh, providing copies of his 2009 novel, My Abandonment. Uh, we'll have copies in print and digital versions for you to read uh, over the summer, and uh, Peter's event will be on August 24th. That's Tuesday, and that's at uh, 6.30. So stay tuned for more details about that. We are really fortunate tonight to have uh, Kavai Strong Washburn joining us from uh, Minneapolis. Kavai was born and raised on the Hamakua coast of the Big Island. Um, and his first novel, which we'll be talking about, Sharks in the Time of Savior, uh, Saviors, won the 2021 Penn Hemingway Award last month, which is awesome for a debut novel. And it also won the 2021 Minnesota Book Award. It was long listed for the 2020 Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and was a finalist for the 2021 Penn Gene Stein Book Award. Uh, it was on everybody's list of top books of 2020, including U.S. President Barack Obama and uh, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Oprah. Everybody praised it. Uh, it's been translated into uh, at least eight languages and counting. And uh, I'm going to bring Kavai onto the stream now. Hi, Kavai. Good evening. Hi. Thanks for having me. You, I'm, re I'm really embarrassed because I'm wearing the same shirt that's in the picture that you had up at the start of the event. <laughs> hey, hang on it. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I swear I own more than one shirt. I just happen to be wearing it today. <laughs> Who knew, right? Who knew? Oh, well. Well, it's, it's great that you could join us tonight from uh, your home in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, we're really excited to uh, chat with you about uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors, which uh, was one of my favorite books of last year. I love this book. I just cannot say enough great things about it. And um, I, I'm so happy that we can have you here tonight. Um, we were chatting a little bit before we got started. Uh, and I was saying that um, I was trying to describe the book to someone who hadn't read it. And um, I got, you know, the basic plot, but then I felt like I had to stop because there's a point at which you really want to have the reader experience the book on their own. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe help me out and help us out by um, giving your description of the plot of the book. <laughs> I can try. You know, I, 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 it's always hard for me. I don't do it any better. And I've had to do it over and over and over. And I'm still not very good at it. So I guess the, the easiest way that I can talk about it is it's about a family in in Hawaii, right around the time of the collapse of the sugarcane industry. It's a, they're a blue collar family in Honoka and they're witness to a miracle when the middle son in the family is saved from a boat accident, saved from drowning by sharks. And so the family interprets this as a sign of, of favor and protection from ancient Hawaiian gods. And they are only validated in that belief when the, this child, his name is Nainoa, begins to sort of, there are these unexplainable sort of abilities that seem to surface within him. And so the story becomes a story about how the family deals with that, that event and the miracle and all the things that come about as a result of that miracle. 
And as the family is kind of fractured by it and they spread over the continental United States, it becomes a story about sort of how they find themselves and how they find them way, their way back to each other. So that's at a high level, that's probably about the best I can do <laughs> without giving too much away. Right, right. Well, there are, there are so many uh, wonderful nuances in the book. And as you mentioned, it is a family saga and uh, the family dynamics, I, I hope, are something that we can talk a little bit about as we um, as we chat this evening. Um, how about reading something for us? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll read. There's a couple of different sections I could read from. I think the one that tends to work best is I'm going to read from the tail end of the first chapter. It's kind of, I think this part, a lot of people really enjoy this. It's kind of, this is, this, this is the event, right? This is, this is told from the perspective of the mother. Uh, her name is Malia and the family is on a, they're taking a little afternoon glass bottom boat ride. It's the kind of thing they never get to do. If you live in the islands, it's the kind of thing that maybe you get to do once or twice. It's not the kind of thing that a lot of tourists would come and experience it. But if you're a family that's hard up for money, the last thing you're going to spend it on is like a glass bottom boat ride. But they do it this one time because they want to feel, they want to feel special. They want to have some moment of just being a family, enjoying time together, doing something that they never get to do. And so they go on this glass bottom boat ride together. And this picks up from, from Malia as she's sort of waking up. She's fallen asleep on the boat with her daughter, Cowie, and she's waking up from that. So I'll just read from this section. I was somewhere warm and slow, and Cowie was asleep in my arms when I woke without knowing why. You and Dean and your father were gone. In fact, no one was in the viewing cabin. Voices were rising out on the deck. I shifted Cowie from my lap. She complained, and I stood. The voices were clipped into basic commands. We're going to make a turn, keep pointing, get the preserver. I remember feeling like the sounds were coming from the other side of a cavern, so far away and cotton stuffed in my head. I grabbed Cowie's hand. She was still rubbing her eyes and complaining, but I was already bringing her with me as I climbed the stairs from the viewing cabin to the sun deck, impossibly white. I had to shade my eyes and squint so hard I felt my lips and gums lift. People were gathered along the cabled rail of the slick white deck, looking into the ocean, pointing. I remember seeing your father and Dean. They were maybe 30 feet away from me and Cowie, and I was confused because your father was wrestling Dean back from the rail, and Dean was screaming, let go, and I can get him. One of the deckhands in a white polo shirt and baseball hat pitched a red life preserver into the air, and it wobbled and wheeled out into the sky with the rope whipping behind. Did I run then to your father? Had he pulled Dean off the rail? Was I gripping Cowie's hand so hard it hurt her? I can assume, but I can't remember. I only remember that I was at your father's side, then on the blazing white deck, rising and falling with the waves, and all our family was there except for you. Your head was bobbing like a coconut in the ocean. You were getting smaller and farther away, and the water was hissing and spanking the boat. I don't remember anyone saying much of anything except the captain calling out from upstairs, just keep pointing, we're turning, just keep pointing. Your head went under and the ocean was flat and clean again. There was a song playing from the speakers, a tinny, stupid, sweet Hawaiian cover of More Than Words, which I still can't listen to, even though I liked it once. The engines churned. The captain was talking from the wheel upstairs, asking Terry to keep pointing. Terry was the one who'd thrown the life preserver that was floating empty in the waves, moving away from where I'd seen your head. I was tired of being told to point, being told to wait, so I said something to Terry. He made a face. Then his mouth was moving under his mustache, words back at me. And the captain was calling again from above. Your father started in too, all four of us saying things. I think I finished talking with something that made Terry start so that his face flushed around his sunglasses. I saw myself in those mirrored lenses, me darker than I thought I was, which I remember made me happy, and my shoulders from basketball, and that I'd stopped squinting my eyes. Then my feet were up on the railing and Terry's eyebrows were raised and he started to open his mouth at me. He reached for me, I think your father did too, but I leapt into the big empty ocean. I hadn't been swimming long when the sharks passed under me. I remember them first as dark blurs, that the water told me the weight of those animals, a shove of wake against my legs and belly. They passed me and all four of their fins punched the surface, knives on the summit of dark swells, 
cutting for you. When they reached where your head had been, the sharks dove under. I started to swim after them, but the distance might as well have been to Japan. I dunked once to try and see. Underwater, there was nothing but a vague darkness and froth where the sharks were. Other dark colors. Pink and chummy ropes rising from the froth. I knew those would be next. I didn't have any more breath. I broke the surface and choked in oxygen. If there were sounds, if I yelled, if the boat was closer, I don't remember. I went back down. The water where you were was all churn. The shapes of the sharks were thrashing, diving, rising, something like a dance. The next time I went for air, you were at the surface sideways, prone and ragdolling in the mouth of a shark. But the shark was holding you gently, do you understand? It was holding you like you were made of glass, like you were its child. They brought you straight at me, the shark that was holding you, carrying its head up out of the water like a dog. The faces of those things, I won't lie. I shut my eyes as they neared when I was sure they were coming for me too. And if everyone was yelling and crying out as I imagined they were, and if I was thinking anything, I don't remember any of that except the black of my closed eyes and my prayers without a mouth. The sharks never hit. They passed again below around me, wake like a strong wind. And then I opened my eyes. You were there at the boat clutched to a life preserver. Your father reaching down for you. I remember how angry I was at how slow he went all the time in the world. And I wanted to say, are you a Palhana County worker? Grab our child, our alive child. And you were coughing, which meant you were breathing. And there was no red cloud in the water. This wasn't just one of those things. Oh, my son, now we know that none of it was. And this was when I started to believe. It's the end of the first chapter. Uh, while you were reading Kabai, we got a comment from uh, Ron who says, as a fellow Kamaiana, the story crushed me, weeping with longing for my Hawaiian home. So that's, uh, uh, I think, a great testament to the power of a uh, place that uh, is very strong in your story. And I, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Um, so over the course of the book, you divide the chapters up into first person narratives, the, the characters, um, Malia, the mother, Augie, the father, and the three children, Dean, uh, Nainoa, and Cowie. And each one of them uh, will alternate in um, telling some aspect of the story as it moves forward from that moment. Uh, you start in 1995, and uh, the story ends in 2009. You mentioned the um, uh, the economic context for that. Can you talk a little bit more about that particular time frame, 1995 to 2009? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to start the story early enough that I could I could talk about one of the things I experienced growing up, which was the collapse of the sugarcane industry on the Hamakua coast of the Big Island, sort of the last harvest that happened. I mean, I, I remember that. I remember I remember seeing that from the library. I was actually at the public library, the Honoka Public Library, when the last harvest came through and all the trucks came through right through town. And, you know, I, I hope the book doesn't paint a, an, an unrealistically bleak picture of Honoka because as a town, it still is very much the town that I remember from when I was a child. And a lot of people there that lost jobs as a result of the collapse of the sugarcane industry found a way to survive and, and to thrive, you know? So, so the town is still very much alive and it's a good, happy, comfortable, safe place. But that there was a, a period of time of great uncertainty after the closing of the, the sugarcane industry. And I think that that's a good place for the book to start because the book goes on to discuss at a high level, a lot of themes that range from, from, anti-colonialism and sort of examining the past of the islands and how you even end up in a situation where the closing of a single agricultural industry can threaten the life of a town, right? The fact that you end up in sort of a monoculture agricultural product production place is, is the result of, of a lot of different factors that, that were 
these things were these things were impressed upon the town externally, right? These are the result of a long running agricultural interest by a lot of foreigners that came to the islands. And so having that be kind of the the inciting event or close to the start of the book gives gives it space for that to be shown as as one of the things that that becomes one of the major themes as we have the children go out to the continental United States and they experience the greater continental United States and feel this friction between their lives and the islands and their lives in San Diego, Spokane, Portland. Uh, and so that, that was kind of why I wanted to start it early enough to, to look at the collapse of the sugarcane industry. And it also gave a chance for, you know, later on in the story, um, when we get to kind of the denouement or the, the tail end of the story, there's, there's, a new, there's a new understanding of the relationship between the family and the land. And so having those be kind of the, the book ending events, I think is really important. It makes for a good frame for a lot of the themes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of the amakua in in Hawaiian culture, the idea of the role that, that say a shark plays in Hawaiian mythology, um, and, and kind of walk us through that uh, that aspect of uh, of Hawaiian culture. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think the the first thing to know is that you know sharks occupy a place of of awe in in native Hawaiian culture and I mean that in like the full sense the full spectrum right both a sense of respect and at some level fear but also a certain type of love that comes about as a result of that as well and it runs that full spectrum and so there are a variety of stories and legends from from ancient Hawaiian mythology for instance that talk about sharks in different forms uh, sometimes as as an aggressor and sometimes as a protector right it can be a variety of things and it's also the the sort of the liquid, the, the plasticity or the li liquidity of kind of like the, the spirit of a, of a given thing, whether we're talking about a deity or, or an ancestor that has passed to move through different animal forms and just move through different forms altogether is something that's also very common and very prevalent throughout Hawaiian mythology. And so the Amakua is, is sort of a, as a concept, it represents a, an ancestor that has come back in the form of an animal and offers protection and guidance to a family through the form of an animal. And so as a general idea, that's, that's kind of the easiest way to describe an amakua. And sharks in particular have been that for a lot of families and for a lot of legends and mythology in the islands. And I also thought that it, having that as, having a shark as that was also for me was a, an important thing because there's still a lot of there's still a lot of demonizing of sharks, which is really sad because they're incredible creatures, and I understand why people are scared of them. I'm scared of them, but um, they're 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 incredible animals, and they've been in some cases almost brought to extinction. You know, certain shark populations have almost collapsed completely. I think like ninety percent of certain shark populations have have gone extinct, and so or not gone extinct, but they've lost about ninety percent of their population, depending on the type of breed we're talking about in the area, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really sad. And I think that one of the things that has been an unfortunate uh, reason for that is because they have occupied a place in sort of common American mythology of being of like a monster, right? Like Jaws did so much damage to mm -hmm. sharks and to their their sort of place in the human imagination here in the United States. And that's sad. And so one of the reasons there's both an Amaku aspect, but also having it be a shark is because I think that, you know, I wanted to kind of give people an opportunity to at least experience an animal in, in different terms, in terms that are more in line with the place that I came from versus the place they've occupied in kind of pop culture in the, in America. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you talk about place, uh, and I think one of the things that really struck me about your book is how Hawaii is almost a character. Uh, it's almost its own presence um, in the book, and that the 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 human characters um, we find them relating to each other, but they're also relating to their to their environment, to the to their surroundings. Um, um, how does that how does that resonate with you? I mean, in terms of of what Hawaii means for you as as a, a as a place, and how that factored into um, how you created this um, this environment for these characters to to uh, to inhabit. Yeah, so it wasn't until 
I had left and lived other places that I really started to understand what a profound effect being born and raised in the islands had had on me in terms of the way that I experienced the natural world and the incredible natural beauty of the islands, which is to me still remain unmatched. I've visited a lot of different places around the world and the, the, the islands are, are beautiful in a very particular way that is unique. And I grew, I grew up among that. And a lot of the, my first experiences of being in the natural world were, were there in the islands. Right. And so it had a profound effect on me and, and the, the, the way I think about the world and the relationship between humans and the natural world was, was influenced heavily by that. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was try and try and capture that. It's very hard to describe, but that's sort of the, the feeling of that, of having this like deeper than surface level interaction with a place and having it, having it have an influence on you that, that extends beyond just sort of the momentary experience of being in a specific physical place, but sort of the ambient parts of it and the, the spirit and soul of the place that can kind of stay with you as well. And so that was something I was trying to find a way to get that on the page, right? Because it's something that I continue to try and revisit and understand uh, because it has a lot of, you know, for, for me, it has a lot of implications for the way that I try to live now and the things I think about. And it also has for me, the the recognition of how valuable and important and symbiotic our relationship has been in the past with the natural world and the way that it needs to return to that in order for us to to survive with a certain amount of sustainability and to thrive in the 21st 22nd 23rd century those things are only going to happen if we really start to to develop a better better relationship with the natural world and see ourselves as in a symbiotic relationship and almost as stewards of a lot of these places then than sort of the classic, I would say like the classic Christian, modern, late capitalist idea of the natural world is just a, a resource to be, to be extracted to the extent that it's necessary, whether we're talking about animals slaughtered and eating them, or whether we're talking about land being only thought of as valuable to the extent that it's productive. Uh, so those are a lot of the things that I was thinking of as I was trying to sort of render the feeling of the islands and, and have the, the spirit of the islands be present in the, mm -hmm. the story. And that, that spirit is, is with these characters even when they leave, right? And they relocate to the West Coast. And it, it's, uh, in, in a way, it's almost something that they have to come to terms with uh, and, and like, uh, like they do with with each other, they they reconcile, right? They 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 learn how to reunite and and to make sense of. Um, and I, I again, I was just so struck by this the 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 sense of place and and particularly at the very beginning, um, talking about um, when we first meet um, Malia and Algi and and how they're out in the world how they're out in this environment and uh you know this is this is when i know it was conceived right and yeah. and 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 that world which to me and i just reread it again today i mean there is this it's it's almost like it sparkles there's there's something in the air um that that it might not be on the page but is so uh so palpable and 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 creates this kind of energy that it makes i think it makes it hard for the characters to avoid, to ignore. Yeah. And it's, I'm glad that you got some sort of a sense of uh, like a, a sparkle to it or things like that. Cause it's certainly, there's so much of the writing, I think no matter how much you try to try to, I don't know, shepherd it and find some way to sort of make the things that are on the page be things that at some level you have control over. There's some element of, of art in general, I believe, but you know, even for writing, there are things that just happen that are beyond your your conscious influence, right? And so a lot of the things that end up in the book that people pick up on are sometimes things I didn't even know consciously I was writing towards, and yet they're there and, and people experience them. And I think that's one of the, the fun things about art. One of the magical things about art is the way that it it can be a different thing to every reader and that you can write something and not really know exactly what's in there and other people will find those things and take them away. Mm -hmm. So that's good. And speaking of the first part, by the way, if you're going, if you haven't read the book yet and you're thinking of getting it in the audiobook form, don't play it in front of your kids or in the car during that first chapter. <laughs> I have a few friends that did that. And it's, um, you know, it, it, it kicks off in a very, kicks off in a very visceral way, shall we say. There's a lot of, 
there's a lot of passion. So just keep that in mind if you're going to listen to the audiobook version. There's also a lot of profanity in it. So. <laughs> Fair warning. Well, yeah. you know, we, we don't we don't like to label things, right? We want to we want to have everybody experience it on their own. But it's a fair warning. Fair warning. Yeah. Um, so, as a result of this experience, um, if we want to kind of move forward a little bit, um, Nainoa or Noah um, begins to um, experience a profound change in his relationship to his world, and this sparks. Um, the tension really in, in, in the family relationship. How much can you talk a, about that without giving, uh, you know, without dropping too many spoilers? Yeah, no, I think I can. So we see, you know, from the part that I read, we have this child that's saved from drowning by sharks. He begins to exhibit these, these sort of abilities that are hard for the family to explain. And as a result of this, he attracts a lot of attention and his, his family, in particular, his parents begin to interpret this all of these events right through a specific lens and that lens is that he's going to be in their eyes the most important member of the family right he's carrying on his shoulders the fate of the entire family and perhaps more than the family right perhaps all of the islands perhaps the whole state they have these incredible dreams of what they think he's going to be and that sort of shapes their narrative of the family but there are two other kids Right? There's a set of three siblings. And so there's a, there's a sister, Kaui, and an older brother, Dean, that are caught up in this. And so, of course, this, you know, this middle child gets all of this attention heaped on him from a variety of places. Some of it's coming from externally as well. And so, of course, the other, these two other children are going to, they're going to fight back against that. There's going to be a lot of resentment and envy and a sense of, of wanting to strike out on their own and define themselves in their own terms outside of the shadow of Nainoa. And so a lot of the dynamics between the, the siblings sort of follow that trajectory for a good portion of the book. It builds to something and then things pivot in a very... For me, interesting and important way because it kind of asks questions of that myth that the parents and, and that sort of a lot of people have been building about the family and about Nainoa. So, mm -hmm. and when that happens and, and things change, then the dynamics in the family shift as well. And, and everybody kind of has to adjust their expectations for themselves. And in some cases, I think one of the things that I was, was playing with was the idea just at a high level of, of, myth, but in particular, the sort of big man theory of history, right? And the idea that, and this, again, to me, is something that I experienced as I've gotten older and I've spent a lot more time studying history and then I've lived long enough to experience events and then have them narrated later on and filtered down through a very specific lens by newspapers and documentaries and all these things that people often are reaching for this very simplistic, individualistic narrative for an event. They want to say, this thing happened and the reason it happened this way is because of one specific individual, right? We talk about things like the civil rights movement and there's like two or three names everybody knows. And we think of those people as being, those were the most important people in the movement, right? That happens with, you know, major changes in like political shifts. We talk about two or three people being at the center of those things. And this, this is a very American idea in my opinion. And so the novel really wanted to sort of take that as the myth the family has of itself and then ask questions about, well, what if it turns out that that's not, a, that's not true? What if this big man theory of history and this idea that an individual, a singular individual is going to be responsible for large changes? What if it turns out that's not really the way the world works? And so that's sort of what the, the sibling dynamics, I feel like really become a place where that question plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the dynamics are, are fascinating. And we watch these three siblings uh, evolve um, and and in many ways, kind of their roles shift and their relationship with each other shifts over time uh, in in some fascinating ways. Um, one one of the things that I wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about was this uh, the role that that the family that particularly the um, uh, uh, Noah's parents um, assign to him as a result of this event. And there's almost the sense that he's going to be the financial savior of the family. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I, up until a certain threshold of, of income, and there've been a lot of studies done about this, like there's a certain threshold of income you hit and it's different in different places as a relative measurement against whatever the cost of living is and all those sorts of things. But up until you hit that level of income, 
every time you make a little more money, there's things get better for you. And you, you actually become happier at some level because you need to take care of some basic amount of, of, you know, what it takes to, to live in the world today, especially when so many things are defined, defined through money and material uh, wealth. And so for the family, you know, this family is living on the edge of poverty after the collapse of the sugarcane industry. And they end up actually moving from the big Island. You know, that happens pretty early in the book. And that's, that's a result of, of the economic opportunities that exist on, on Oahu in particular, right in Honolulu. And so they travel there from the big Island because, you know, Augie's got a, I think he's got a cousin that's on that works in Honolulu somewhere that's able to kind of help him get a job, like has a connection that can help him get a job. And so for, for a lot of the story, one of the, one of the biggest challenges for the family is to save financially solvent. And so to the extent that any of the children have something that can be, that can be monetized, that has monetary value, then that always becomes a question like, okay, well, look, let's, you, let's get some money out of this. Can we get some money out of this? And I think that for a lot of readers, some of that they get a little bit uncomfortable with, right? Cause they're just sort of like, well, it seems like the family is like the parents seem like they're almost exploiting a child when a child has something of value and they go out and try and get money off of it. But again, these are things I wanted to talk about when I talk about, say, for instance, capitalism in the United States and how there are very few things that are guaranteed to you in the United States unless you've got the money for them. And if you can't afford whatever the thing is, then you don't get it, right? And so when the terms are that stark and when they're that stark for even the most basic things like food and shelter and healthcare, then of course, if you're in a position where you don't have a lot of money, any opportunity you have to make money that isn't, you know, like wildly illegal or violent or things like that, right? If you've got a, a way to make money that's relatively legitimate, of course, you're going to take that opportunity. And so the for the children, that's part of, of the burden that they all carry is trying to figure out, you know, they can see their parents struggling. They can all feel the, the hurt of not having enough. And so there's always a question of like, well, how can we get more? How can we get enough? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the part that's interesting with Dean's story, and again, I'm not giving anything away here, is he, for me, becomes a character that represents like the like the uber capitalist. Like he's almost like the alpha male of capitalism. He's just like and but he's also very practical. Right. And he is one that's basically like, look, here are the terms of this world. Like I can see exactly the way this works. And the way it works is if you have enough money, you're safe, you're happy. Like everything that we're dealing with right now goes away if we have enough money. And so I'm going to make sure we get enough money. However, I need to make that happen. However, and part of that's very noble. I think I thought that it was really interesting to, to recognize that a lot of the decisions Dean makes, I think a lot of people, including myself, like he don't really want to read about the things he's doing or the things he's thinking, right? In a lot of ways, he's a really hard character to like because he's so awful in a lot of ways. But you, he, like, he loves his family deeply. Right. And he's very he's very loyal and he's determined to help his family achieve enough financial stability that they don't ever have to be scared again. I think he even says that at one point. He's like, I just don't want us to be scared anymore. Right. And so I, all of the characters have some different version of that they're coping with. Cowie has to deal with these expectations that are pushed on her by her family that they, they kind of like remind her that she owes them things because they sacrificed in order for her say for instance to get to college right she has that hanging over her head she can kind of feel them kind of reminding her well like you're not in college just because you're smart you're in college because we gave up a lot of things and so they all have this different version of of sort of the 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 guillotine of like capitalism hanging over them debt and things like that. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, Dean and I, and I, I said at the beginning that the, the chapters alternate um, and each character has an opportunity to reflect on a particular moment. Um, how difficult was it for you to inhabit those three characters? Um, all of whom are very different from each other. Um, and and how did you how did you uh, what was the process for coming up with that kind of um, uh, core of their being uh, as you as you were working on that? Yeah, yeah. So it was definitely difficult. It was very hard. I think the first year's worth of work was really just trying to get to a place where I felt like I could, if I wanted to at any given time, if I was like, all right, I'm going to write this scene, and it's going to be from the perspective of this character, to feel like I understood them and their voice and the nuances of their their grammar, their diction, the way they thought, all of those things, be able to to write a scene from their perspective without starting from scratch, like in my head, right? And so 
that took a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff that's not in the book where I was just writing, writing things happening to the character from their perspective so that I could work on their voice and also just get some thoughts about what does this character believe or what is this, what are this characters sort of, what are the nuances of their, you know, their, their jealousies and their wants and their sort of self, self-destructive behaviors and the things that they're misbeliefs, like trying to figure out all of those things through a few just different scenes. So I would just put them in situations that I knew weren't going to be things in the book, but maybe they could inform some sort of backstory. Like, you know, what happened with Cowie and Dean when they were like, you know, 14 or something, you know, like there's, cause there are some sections that jumps in time and you skip, you know, collections of years at times. Mm -hmm. And so some of those spaces I wrote in knowing that they probably wouldn't be in the book, but to have a, uh, just a situation I could put the characters in and really like dig into them without being concerned about whether or not it was moving the plot forward. So I spent a lot of time doing that. And I spent a lot of time trying to make each one of their voices believable and somewhat related, but very distinct, which was a challenge. And it uh, just took a lot of rewriting and like consistency, like finishing a whole set of pages and then going back and seeing if every place where the phrases were happening, if they were similar enough to how they happened before to represent sort of a, a speech pattern and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a part of it as well. And I think the, the biggest challenge is that none of them are based on me or anybody I know, at least not consciously. Anytime it felt like I was working in the mold of referencing somebody or something I had witnessed in the past or things like that, then I would push that away and go in a totally different direction and challenge myself to really make these characters up completely from scratch. And so that was, um, that was another big, big challenge. It took a lot of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and one thing that, again, as I went back and, and was uh, rereading recently, the, the one thing that, that really stood out for me is that even with a character like Dean, who is, I think, a hard character to, to like, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you don't judge your characters, right? I mean, there's not this sense that, that, um, that you're telling us uh, or you're creating a situation where we have to feel a certain way about a character, you really leave that for us to discover and kind of hold that in suspense, right? Because there is the sense that something is going to happen with this character. And in fact, that it, it does. I mean, all of the characters go through these really significant life transformations. Um, how, how difficult is when you're writing a character like Dean to not not <laughs> want to sit in judgment of them and, and, yeah. and you know, yeah. kind, of, kind of come down and say, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So I think that that was, that was a huge challenge and it was like that for Cowie as well. And not because I think that, so Dean was a character. I definitely wanted to challenge myself to write a character that was completely unlike me, like wholly unlike me in every way where we would have a very antagonistic relationship if they were somebody I met in person. Right. Or it's very much like, let me imagine somebody that would have like beaten me up in high school <laughs> and that's Dean. Right. And so, but the thing is, is, is I think that I was reading at some point when I was working through this novel, I remember reading an interview with somebody that was working in maximum security prisons. And I might be getting some of this wrong. It's hard to remember because some of this was like years ago, like eight or nine years ago that I was reading these things, but he had, he, so he was working in a maximum security prison in some form of counseling. And I don't know if he was doing something as simple as sort of introducing the, the inmates to art or whether he was working on, on larger reforms or things like that. But his perspective on it, because a lot of people would ask him, they're just like, well, what is this like? What is it like working with, you know, people that are in maximum security prison, because some of them are in there for really heinous crimes, right? And and he said, well, everybody, everybody is more than the worst thing they've ever done, right? Like we're not, like our biggest mistake is not all of who we are, right? Or not even, might not even necessarily have been a mistake, but like the worst thing you've ever done, that's not the entire story of who you are. And I think that I, I really tried to, to live that out through Dean's character in the sense of really trying to figure out, because even if we're talking about people that like beat me up in high school, I'm like, somebody loved them, right? They had sisters or, right. you know, boyfriends or girlfriends or significant others or whatever that loved them. And they had friends and people that thought they were great people. And so how does that happen, right? How can you be this one person in one situation and a totally different person in another situation? And in the case of Dean, I really wanted to be like, well, but like, he loves his family. Like he does not dislike his family. Like he loves his family deeply and has a sense of loyalty to them. And so how would that play out against these other aspects of him that at some level he doesn't have the best control of, or that, 
the world in some, in some sense encourages those things, right? Cause there are elements of then him that come out as he becomes an incredible basketball player. There's a certain amount of privilege he's able to exercise as a basketball player. Cause you know, if you're a gifted athlete in American society, you can get, you can get a lot from that as a high school athlete, as a college athlete in particular, if you can get to a major school, there's a certain amount of privilege that comes along with a lot of those things. And so some of those, some of the things that he becomes, that these are external forces that are encouraging him, that are sending him in those directions as well. So he's a product of many things, not just his own decisions. Mm -hmm. And so those were the sort of things I wanted to, I wanted to explore with him. And, you know, some of these are things even I've experienced myself in my own life. I've seen how I've changed in different situations, given the power structures of whatever I'm in, whether that's working as like a teacher or, you know, working for corporate America and all these different there are all these different incentives that are in play that sort of work against each other and they can lead you to, to, to behave differently than you would have normally. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that keeping all those things in mind as you, you have characters and trying to, to recognize that, you know, as much as, again, we come back to this idea of like the individualist, right. And a narrative that, that holds a lot of sway in America is the idea of like, you, you are who you are because of the choices you make and that's it. Right. There's some people that really believe deeply, like you succeed because you want to or you fail because you're not you're not good enough. You made bad mistakes right. and, and that's it. And I just don't think that that's true. I have never experienced that. Not, and I don't mean personally. I mean, as I've observed and lived in the world, people that I've known from a variety of backgrounds that have had a variety of levels of like success, quote unquote, there are so many different circumstances at play and so many things that are bigger than the moment and the individual that have some influence on how things become. And so with Dean, I really wanted to figure out a way to have those things play out on the page and to challenge myself to also make him like really still be somebody that does like a lot of bad things and has a lot of awful thoughts. But at the end of the story, I think a lot of people still, you can, you can at least understand him. You don't have to agree with him or like him, but you can at least understand him. And it's hard not to, to, to recognize that there is a certain logic and love to a lot of the things he does even if there's a lot of things he does that don't feel that way mm -hmm. um and now writing a character like cowie i mean how do you put yourself in the head of a young girl i mean that's that's completely uh a, that's sort of a completely foreign uh space to occupy right i mean how do you how do you how do you know that you got it right <laughs> uh, I think the place that I started from is is treating treating any individual as just a is as a a consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of any idea of gender or race or socioeconomic status or age, just as a consciousness in a space and time, right? And starting from that and having some sense of the characteristics of that person. And then spending the time to think about how things are different contextually, given the type of person you are in a given situation, right? Whether you're a woman of a certain age in this situation or that situation, or, or you know, whether you're, whether you're older or younger, like all of those things play out different ways in, in different situations. But first, just starting from a consciousness, like not being afraid to be like, yeah, a person is, is just a person at the end of the day, right? There are certain things that are different between you know, this individual and that individual that are influenced based on any set of identity characteristics, whether they're talking about race or skin color or their, their gender identity or things like that. Yes, those things all have an influence and it. You will feel different if you're this person than that person. But it's not like it's this totally, you know, completely different world if you're a man or a woman or things like that. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed also was the opportunity to, to, to like really experience the feminine side of myself, right? And for a lot of people I've talked, I've talked a lot about with Malia, as I have become a parent, I've, I've really worked on, on cultivating my maternal instinct and my maternal side, right? Because I think it's something for such a long time that men have been socialized not to be in touch with the things that we consider more feminine or, or the maternal instincts, right? And so like learning how to nurture and care in a way that is in some ways was very foreign to me has been a wonderful part of being a parent and, and working on some of those same sorts of things with, with Cowie was, was a lot of fun. Right. And also having her kind of defeat a lot of the standard stereotypes that one might, one might see from a, a young female character in a novel. So it was, I, you know, I was just playing with all those things at the same time and, and trying to find a way to do those things that was satisfying and also reflected what I had observed 
and red. You know, like I have a lot of friends that are that are that are women from a variety of gender identities, actually. And and I've spent time hearing from them about the experiences they've had. I've read plenty of of fiction and nonfiction from a variety of different writers about their lives and their experiences. And you can draw on all those things as well as your own observer, you know, observations to to arrive at something that feels to me like it's it's truthful at some level. It's never going to be perfect, but I don't think I don't think anyone perfect any one person is ever going to be able to render you can never render the entirety of any sort of identity through one, right. you know, one experience because even within a given gender, for instance, people are going to have a variety of experiences and so that's also right. nice because it's freeing because it means you can't get it like quote unquote wrong because there's no one right sure. way to be a woman or anything like that, right? So, sure, sure, sure. Um, well, and you, you talked earlier about um, using language and um, one of the things readers will recognize almost immediately is um, how you use uh, vernacular uh, as a, as a, a a storytelling device. What was the process for that? I mean, was that was that a, a decision you made early on, or or how did you how did you decide to do that? Yeah, yeah. And I know we were talking, and I guess in the green room or before we were live, about some of the different writers that have influenced me, or the ones that I even talked about and thanked in the book that were specifically from the islands. And one of the things that I remember being very striking from the first time I read Lois and Yamanaka was it was the first time I. Th- think is kind of, especially as like a reader that was paying attention, it's like, I don't know, maybe I was in like my late teens or early 20s when I first read one of her books. Mm -hmm. And it was so clear that it was like, she wrote in thick pigeon and she didn't, like, it was so clearly written. It was either like, either you're going to come along for the ride if you don't understand pigeon or, or you understand pigeon. And this is your, I'm re- this is for you then, right? Like you're reading right. this and you and me know what all of this is. And if this is something that's unfamiliar to you, then either come along for the ride or, you know, get out of the train. Or whatever. <laughs> and um, it was just, it was so amazing to experience that. It was just unapologetically like written from the islands without any sense of like, oh, you know, like a white person re- that hasn't ever been to the islands is going to be reading this. So I should make sure I write it in a way that kind of helps them understand the vernacular. Like if it's just like, nope, <laughs> there's none of that whatsoever. Right. Uh, and so I knew that that was something that I really was really important for me to have in the novel because I've always appreciated writers that when they're writing from a certain place or a certain people, they open the door but they don't, they don't pull you through the door, right? Or they don't guide you through or walk you through. They're just sort of, here's the door. Here's the thing going on. You step in. You, you have to take a step towards this and, and challenge yourself to come into this space. And, and I've always loved that because it takes work as a reader to do that. But when you do it, like you come out a different person. At least I have, right? So when I've, when I've read work from, I don't know, whether it's like the Dominican Republic or Nigeria or or Iran or things like that. Like when I read these books and there's a lot of the context that's just there and it's like, you have to do the work to figure it out. Then when it's over, you've taken this even bigger journey in your mind. And for me, some of those experiences never leave. And so I know that there are some people that when they read this, they appreciated that as well. I think there's some people that didn't, uh, which is fun. It, that happens and it's fine. Sure. But I sure. really wanted to make sure that was a part of it. I think the one thing that was a challenge is as a reader, I have a really hard time when there's a lot of when there's a lot of like apostrophes and like the spellings of the word are done so phonetically that it kind of, it just slows my brain down. And mm-hmm. so there's a way that most people write pigeon on the page. And I made a conscious decision to render it a little bit differently on the page. I left out a lot of the apostrophes. There are certain words that like, if, if you see somebody write it in the islands and they're going to write kind of like the standard pigeon way, it was spelled differently than the way that I did it in this book. And one of the reasons I made that choice was just for myself as a reader, I know I've always, I've preferred when there's there's just enough similarity between what I'm sort of, the sound is different and the grammar is different, but the words are not so different that it trips up my head because it slows me down as a reader kind of visually. Mm-hmm. And so when I was rendering, particularly Dean's sections, because his, his pigeon's really thick, I had to make the choice to, I didn't have to, but I decided to write his language and to write pigeon with trying to respect the musicality and the rhythm and the sound of it while not including a lot of the spellings and sort of punctuation that for me as a reader typically trip me up. So I was trying to find a kind of strike, strike a balance between those two. Mm-hmm. I know there are some readers that were kind of miffed at that because they thought that 
it was maybe not the best representation of pigeon, but I think I'm just sort of like, it's one of the fun things about language is like, nobody owns it. <laughs> right? Right. It, it, can, right. it can, you know, that's what, that's what's beautiful about it. It's always expanding. It's always changing. And um, there's not necessarily one right way for a thing to be on the page. So. Right. Yeah. And that's part of that contract that you enter in to as a reader, right? That, that this is, this is the agreement that I sign uh, to carry in this story. And I'm either going to uh, agree to, to it or not. And you make that decision. Uh, but, you know, it's like anything. If you, if you make that agreement and you go along for the journey, when you get to the end, you really feel like you've experienced something uh, in a very different way. And you mentioned um, uh, uh, Lois and Yamanaka. Um, are there other writers that you can think of from the islands who have, who have, um, uh, embraced uh, writing in the vernacular or writing in pidgin? Yeah, you know, Lois and Yamanaka was the first big one. There are plenty of writers from the islands. You know, there's a lot of people that came out of the, the Bamboo Ridge School, and that's just like it was a group of writers. This is a group of writers a long time ago. And there's also a ton of writers that have been published through the University of, ha of Hawaii Press that are um, that write through a variety of different um, levels of vernacular and things like that. You know, um, Christiana Caja Calvila came out with a short story collection, I think at this point, probably about, I want to say like five years ago, maybe a little bit less, called This is Paradise. Mm -hmm. And she writes in a variety, like the, the characters inhabit a, a whole range of things. There's, um, there's Cowie Hemmings, who wrote the, um, the Descendants, but she also wrote a short story collection called House of Thieves. I think I'm getting that right. I might be messing it up. Biggest house of thieves mm -hmm. and that one's great as well because you get to see parts of the islands in a totally different way than i think even myself as a writer that had read a lot of different books from the islands she kind of captured a lot of situations that i had never encountered before like people working in upcountry maui and things like that um and so yes yeah, so there's kiana davenport there's kawi hemming's heart um there's christiana kahakau vila lois and yamanaka there's a bunch of other ones i could keep going mm. sometimes it's hard to remember <laughs> well, they all get a shout out in your book as yeah. writers that have had a, a profound influence on you. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what is it that, um, what, what was that thing that resonated with you? What are, what are some of the things that you pulled from their writing? Yeah, so I think one of the big ones was to which I guess I, maybe I, this would have been the case anyway, but I think that I was, it was heartening to see other writers have some level of success working in a space that was, there was no self-consciousness. Again, there was no sense of needing to explain oneself and there was no sense in having the central characters be ones that were, you know, quote unquote, like familiar to the reader. Cause all these things assume a certain type of reader, right? So I think the biggest thing that I, I kind of learned was like, there's no need to assume any certain reader. You can write just what you want to write, the things that interest you, the things you care about, the things that you want to talk about or that your mind is drawn to. You write those things and you write them in the way that you want to. And there will be readers out there. Like there's, you're not the only person that's going to have your tastes and your sort of the things that you like. And the readers that are drawn to those same things will the book will resonate with them and there'll be some readers that'll come to it and it'll be the first time they've experienced something like that and that'll totally blow their minds and make them really excited and there's some people that'll it won't really work for them and that's fine you know but to not to not be afraid to take the chance to write the kind of work that you want to write regardless of whether or not there's any sense of whether it's going to be commercially successful or what the audience may or may not be, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that those things were all at play. I think one of the things I really love about Christiana Caja Calvila's short story collection is she, she really has a whole range of writing in there, like a variety of perspectives. She plays with time and language and all of those things in there, I think suggest a certain amount of, of artistic freedom and range that is always fun to consider. And I think it's for me, the, the, the prose has to do something, right? I can't just have a story. I've never been one that, uh, that, uh, that is particularly prefers to write in like a very reserved realist tone. You know, I think there's a lot of fiction, especially short fiction in the United States that the longer you're in, in my opinion, from a lot of writing programs, I've seen writing come out. It, it, it there's like this certain, there's almost like a deadness to it in which it's so studied 
the, the prose is so studied that it starts to lose its own life, right? So I think seeing other writers sort of embrace that, that reject the idea of having to be so studied that it loses its life was something that I, I picked up from a lot of those writers as well. I'm uh, popping her name into the chat because I want to make sure that folks uh, get the title of that collection, This is Paradise, yeah. and that they also um, her name so right now. Um, we talked before um, we went live about the last year, and uh, so uh, your novel came out just a little over a year ago. And it's your first novel. Um, a lot has happened <laughs> in that year, as we uh, as we discussed, uh, from the pandemic to uh, an election to uh, the events at the Capitol on January sixth to um, <sighs> what else am I leaving out? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is like yeah. everything. There's the murder of George Floyd. The murder of George Floyd. In Twin Cities. Yeah. And even just this year, as, as the trial of Derek Chauvin was in progress, Dante Wright was shot. Um, so we had, you know, there was a lot of, of violence. It was racially charged violence here in the Twin Cities over that course of that year. Yeah, the, the pandemic just took everything over. Yeah, there was the election. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, how do you, yeah, how, do you how do you... Um, how do you create in that environment? Uh, how do you find the the energy to 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 produce something uh, in 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 a year that has just been completely off the rails? Yeah, I, you know, so it went through stages. So, for instance, at one point, you know, when we were in the middle of the lockdown, um, it was me, and my wife, and our two children here at home, right? Just like any other, like I think a lot of other families would have to go through. It was just us. We had nobody else to rely on. There was no, you know, there's no larger like safety net except for ourselves. And so for several months, there was just no space to write because we were having to take care of our kids full time and try and help them get through, especially our older daughter, get her through like online school. And we were both having to work at the same time. Right. And so during those during those months, it was like I was getting up really early, which I get up about five o'clock every morning to write. But instead of using that time to write. I would start my work day and then part way through the day around like 11 or so I would, I would stop work and take care of our children for the rest of the afternoon. And my wife would work. And then once we got our kids in bed, both she and I would go back to work for a couple more hours. Right. So there was no space for almost anything except trying to take care of our kids and, and get through every day. And some of that started to ease off, you know, the daycares opened back up, the distance learning got a little bit more manageable. There were some breaks. We got to a point where we could start, you know, we, we had isolated ourselves enough and other family members had that we had some family members we could rely on to help us take care of our children. And so then, then I started to get back to a place where it felt like I could do a little bit of writing again. But, you know, I think that just in general, and even as the year went on and, and, you know, more and more events kept piling on, there were times when it was, I didn't write and that was okay. But I think one of the, the things that I loved the most was reading. And I think you know, this, I think this, this came out, uh, Caitlin Greenridge, who wrote, she wrote, uh, we love you. We love you, Charlie Friedman, um, Charlie Freeman. I'm messing it up now. Sorry. I think that's it. Um, I'm always so bad on these events. I always mess up people's <laughs> names and the titles. Of the book. It's like super embarrassing, but I get really nervous. And then I mess up the name or the title. Um, but she also is a columnist for the New York times. Right. But she's, she wrote this piece talking about being a mother Right. And she, in particular, being a black mother, she was talking with her mother about her hesitation or her fear about bringing a child into the world right now, especially with regards to climate change, but even just all the other things that are happening in the world. And, you know, she's bringing a child into the world and she's just super scared. She's like, should I even do this? Is this the right thing to do? And her mom was explaining, she was like, if we had ever like thought that the future was so certain that we could bring a child into it, we would never have had children, right? And she was talking about herself as a black woman being like, if, if black women had waited until we thought that there was a guarantee that the world would be something our children could inhabit safely, like we would never have children, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that, I think about that just as a parent, but I also think about that as an artist that like, 
there are so many people that have made art, even in like the most harrowing circumstances. And Rebecca Mackay, she wrote her latest novel is The Great Believers. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. She has a, an essay she wrote for Electric Literature, I believe. And she talks about this as well from just in the perspective of an artist, where there were like all these artists in a variety of situations that were like, they were like political prisoners and they were writing on, you know, napkins in their cell. Uh, and then they would read the poem to somebody else and then swallow the napkin before they could get caught with a napkin and like things like that, right? Or even um, Curious George, right? That story, Margaret and H.A. Ray. H.A. Ray, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. yeah, yeah. They fled the Nazi invasion of France with the first manuscript of Curious George. They took that with them, right? Like the husband built a bicycle by hand they fled the Nazi occupation of France on this bicycle with just a couple of things in their back. And then one of the things they took with them was the manuscript for the first Curious George. So this isn't even, we're not even talking like world shifting literature here, right? It's Curious George. So like this desire to create art and to find a place for art, even in the most harrowing circumstances, like people have been doing it for a long time. And, you know, it's, I, I, sometimes I wish I could ex explain why I write or why I want to, but you have this impulse to create and and you do it whether the circumstances necessarily feel like the proper time to do it or not and you just fit it in with the rest of your life as a human so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you are working on a, a second book i am yeah it's 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 been slow going it's taken some some different turns here and there in the year again like i this book you know the the writing portion of it for me was done i think at this point two two plus years ago i think the last words that I wrote and turned into my editor that happened, I think two years ago or something like that. So for the last two years, any writing I've done has been on something new. And so, yeah, I've been, I've been working on a new novel. Um, it's exciting. You know, it spans a couple different time periods. It has elements of climate change. It has, it has elements of like the ancient world. There's, there are a lot of fun, different things in it. There's, yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I can talk about it more of it. I don't want to give it, I don't want to get too right. Much, <laughs> yeah. Well, Kavai was wondering if, uh, as we wrap up here, um, if you might uh, take us out with another um, reading from uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors. Yeah, let me see. Let's see what I can find here. I have this one section. Okay, yeah. Hey, I've got this one part I can read. This is from later on in the story. And at this point, um, Nainoa is out in the world and he's, he's an adult. He's, he's actually out of college. Uh, he's working as a paramedic. I won't say too much more than that, but this scene is not him as a paramedic. He's on a bus and he sees something from an alley and uh, he goes to investigate what it is. And so I'll read through this, this section as well. So this is Nainoa. He's an adult, 20, 20 something. I was turning these thoughts over barely stopping for crosswalk signals, jaywalking in slants across busy thoroughfares when something caught my eye. I'd passed two buildings, the alley between them, and saw the asymmetrical slab of a dead Labrador resting 100 feet down the alley. I had no idea what had happened to it, but I was certain it was dead, felt the rigor mortis running along its torso, as unyielding a curve as a frozen hillside. And when I touched the body, the colors I felt inside were barely more than whispers of violet and midnight blue. The dog was long dead, I searched inside anyway, all along the body's length, finding the jagged wound of the broken skull, there but crushed by something I could only assume was a tire. Even with my eyes closed and everything in me pouring into the dog's body, I knew I couldn't do this. The body wasn't listening the way they normally did, eagerly awaiting my vague explanation of how to make themselves right. I thought again of what Aaron had said, what my family had always alluded to, what I was supposed to be. I flexed myself harder, trying to encourage the life to show itself again, just for a moment, so I could harness it. Something in my head popped, went bitter, bursts of fire and twisting ache all along my back as I bore down. How can a skull recognize itself to want to be whole again? There was nothing than the echo of nothing. I dove further in. I forgot myself. All blackness. Could I start something? I tried and failed. It was like yelling into the bottom of a lake. I pushed harder, my whole body gripping the idea, the want of life. Can I make the life here again? You're going to come back. I gasped, opened my eyes briefly. The same gray alley and stained stucco walls, my vision splattered with the patterns I'd been seeing inside. Then came chill swamps of sweat at my armpits, neck, and crotch. 
I gathered myself again, closed my eyes, flexed everything. There was a spark. Something shifted in the dog's body. The trickle of electricity that was all that was left of a life. It was something at least. It was in the dog again when it hadn't been a moment before. And I held it with my mind along with the injuries, the skull fragments, the messy smear of teeth and jawbone, and pushed harder. The electricity flared, then faded. The dog went dark in my mind and my whole skull hurt. The teeth I'd been grinding, something behind my nose made a crepitous sound. I wouldn't let go, no, having resuscitated something of a soul. My hands were still there somewhere, holding this animal's body, the legs that had padded softly and flexed and shot the often desperate hungry body between the dark barrels of trash cans, the hot relief of recently parked cars, legs that supported a trembling casual defecation, legs that had cupped and tapped and battered trash and rats and kittens. This animal had tasted joy and terror and time. I could bring it back. And the spark inside became a steady trickle of light and the trickle became a flood and brightness coursed through the animal's body like a city waking from a blackout. I opened my eyes. The dog's skull was sealed and it lay there, gently panting through its thawed fur, as warm and leathery as a boot left in a sunny mudroom. It stood, shivered, shook its head so hard, its ears made slapping sounds against its perfect skull, then trotted away, leaving the alley. I wanted to call out to it, to ask the dog to stay. Could I take it home? But exhaustion rolled over me so fast that I collapsed on my ass and fell over sideways onto the ground, closed my eyes. I woke with the frost of the alley pressing up into my ribs, clavicle patellas, lips gritted with road filth. I was lying in the same place where the dog had been, only now the sun had shifted behind the buildings completely and there was no warmth in the alley. I composed myself on my knees and shivered again and again. Never before had I saved something so far gone, human or animal. Death looked just, death looked just as I'd expected, silence and a hollow darkness. And from that place, I'd pulled back the lightning of life. Thank you. The uh, judge's description of uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors for the uh, Penn Hemingway uh, says that the book offers its reader the unforgettable experience of discovering wonder on the page, both in its careful attention to detail and also in the way that detail recasts our own reality. And I think that uh, excerpt that you just read is a perfect example of that. Kavai, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Folks, get this book. Get this book. <laughs> it is an amazing book. Uh, Copies available. Visit your local library and get this. I yeah. can't recommend it highly enough. Visit uh, your local library. Yeah, I, wrote, I wrote sections of the novel in multiple libraries, actually. So I wrote part of it in, uh, we, I was living in DC. I wrote part of it in a few different public libraries in DC. And I wrote part of it, some of the revisions when we were living in California in the Redwood City Public Library as well. So, nice. you know, this book is a, is a product of, of public libraries. So. All thank the more reason, me. all the more reason. Pick this book up. It is a wonderful book. Kavai, thank you so much for joining us this evening from Minneapolis and um, be well. Thank you. Thank you. All Same right. to you. Thank you very right. much for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you back here in August for uh, Peter Rock, August 24th. Until then, good night, everybody.